Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 100 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Wow, here we are at episode 100. This is really amazing. So few podcasters make it past episode seven, and here we are at episode 100. This is an occasion worth marking, and some time ago I asked you how you wanted to celebrate, and you replied that you wanted someone to interview me. So I found the host, you submitted the questions, and here we are. Episode 100, where I, Liz Covart, am the guest historian. Given that this is such a special episode, I recorded it a bit differently. I asked my friend and fellow historian Joseph Edelman if he would come over and record the episode in my small home studio. He agreed, and we had a face-to-face conversation about history, podcasting, and time travel. And we didn't have any glitches with the phone. During our conversation, we discussed how I became interested in early American history, how Ben Franklin's world came about, and the work I do to produce each episode, and where I would go and who I would eat with if I had a time machine. But first, I'd really like to thank you for tuning in and supporting the show. I don't think when I started Ben Franklin's World, I ever thought about producing 100 episodes or going beyond it. But your enthusiasm and passion for well-researched early American history has driven me forward, as have all of your word-of-mouth recommendations, emails, tweets, and Facebook posts about the show. I've sincerely appreciated all of your support and encouragement, and I can honestly say that we are here at episode 100 because of you. Thank you. Are you ready to peer inside Ben Franklin's world and my work as a historian? Allow me to introduce you to our guest host. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Today's host is an assistant professor of history at Framingham State University. In addition to being an ardent fan of the Baltimore Orioles, he's a historian of media, communications, and politics in the Atlantic world. And he has a book project in the works, too. His book looks at the business of printing and the circulation of political news between 1763 and 1789. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Joseph Edelman. Thanks for having me, Liz. I'm happy and honored to be here to guest host the show for your 100th episode, where we turn the tables and interview you. I have one or two questions of my own, but really, this episode is about your listeners getting a chance to ask you questions about you and the podcast. So we'll go ahead and get started with some of their questions. That sounds like a great plan, Joe. And I have to admit, before we get started here, that it feels a bit weird to be an actual guest on Ben Franklin's World. First, we'll start at the beginning. Two of your listeners, Sylvia and Doug, both want to know how you became interested in history and specifically in colonial North America. How did that process work? Was there a book or a movie or a friend that influenced you in your decision to become a historian? I don't think there was one moment or one movie or one book that caused me to want to be an early American historian. Looking back on it, there were probably three or four factors that went into that decision. First, I was born in New England and I grew up in the region. It's a region that takes its role as the cradle of liberty very seriously. And it's really hard to escape early American history, especially when your parents like to pack you and your brother up in the car and take you to what seems like every museum and historic site in the region, most of which seem to have to do with colonial or revolutionary America. So that's one factor. The second factor, I didn't grow up in a household where we had a cash allowance. If we wanted money, we had to work for it. So we did chores around the house. We got paper routes, but we did get an allowance in books. And I forget how it worked out, but we were allowed like a book or two every week or every other week. So my brother and I grew up to be voracious readers. And looking back on it, it seems like my reading tastes went from Cat in the Hat to Clifford the Big Red Dog to Roald Dahl to history books. 
And I remember being in middle school and just deciding one day, you know, I need to know more about United States history. And I remember the logic of it. It was like I was just going to start reading and I'd start in the colonial period and work my way up to the present. Only I started in the colonial period, got to revolutionary America, and I'm still there today. I'm still reading about revolutionary America today. It's my favorite period. And I think a lot of why I wanted to be a historian has to do with all those books that I would read. A third factor was I always had teachers who encouraged my passion and interest in research. I'm one of those people that loves to find the answer for everything. And my teachers always supported that by giving me the toughest research projects, even as a little kid in school. And one research project in particular particular was basically an extra credit assignment. My high school history teacher, Mr. Johnson, saw that I was a little bored. It was United States history. And because I'd been reading all those history books, I was a bit bored. And he took me aside one day in the fall and he said, you know, I'm a history teacher by day, but by night and weekend, I deal in antiques. I buy out the contents of people's houses and then I sell their furniture and antiques for money. And while I was clearing out this house, I found this poster of Irish nationalists and I know almost nothing about them. So here's the information. Why don't you go to the library and see what you can find? And I took that information to my local library. And when it didn't turn up anything, I took it to the local college library. And when that didn't turn up anything, I went to the Boston Public Library. And at the Boston Public Library, I got a lead that the New York Public Library likely had this publication on Irish American news in their microfilm department. So I don't remember whether I emailed or called, but I got in touch with the New York Public Library and found that they had this Irish American periodical. And I remember asking them if they would lend that microfilm and they said, no, we can't lend the microfilm. You have to come in and look at it. And I was pretty bummed because I wanted to find out more about these guys in this poster. And so I went to my parents and I said, hey, I know it's near Christmas time and we're going to go to Long Island to visit grandma and grandpa. Do you think we could take a day trip into New York City so I could go to the New York Public Library and spend a day looking at microfilm? And I could tell by the look on my parents' face that they were a little baffled by this request, but they didn't want to deny it. So they did arrange for us to go into New York for a day. And I did go to the New York Public Library for a few hours, sit and look at microfilm. And I found what I was looking for. I found information on these Irish nationalists. I came back from Christmas break, gave it to Mr. Johnson. And I remember him saying, I never actually expected you to find anything. But that showed me that I had a real passion for research. And I was really interested in that sort of thing, too. And then I guess the last factor, and this is kind of a minor factor, but it played a role, is sometime during middle school or early high school, I found out that I had early American ancestors. Some of my ancestors came over from the Netherlands and settled in New Netherland, mostly in the southern New York and New Jersey area. And what was really interesting was history, which had always seemed alive, suddenly became more alive. Because as I'm reading about the American Revolution, I could try and imagine what my ancestors must have been thinking when they had to pick sides. Because in my family, we had patriots, loyalists, and neutrals. So we were a real American family because we had them all. And I just thought that was really interesting. So yeah, I guess looking back on it, I would say those four factors, really those three factors, probably contributed to my wanting to go to college and study history and become a historian. There was some stunned silence there. So as a slight follow up, as a child in my family, I was famous for reading Johnny Tremaine five or six thousand times. Was there any particular book as a kid that was really the one that captivated you? Well, I have a confession. I've never actually read Johnny Tremaine. I didn't read a whole lot of historical fiction. I know I read a lot of the popular stuff because that's what I found on bookshelves, but I got really good at mining footnotes early on. So it wasn't long before I got into the really scholarly type of history and was reading things like Bernard Balin's Ideological Origins of the American Revolution which was really difficult for me to get through the first time. But by the second or third times, I found it to be a really fascinating book. The only middle schooler interested in revolutionary pamphlets. That was probably more high school, but yes. Okay. Mark is interested in what your Albany book project is about. And I will say as a preface before you answer that as part of preparing for this, I went back and listened to the pilot episode of the podcast. I don't know how many of your listeners have done that recently. And it made your project make more sense to me because you're a New Englander and a native New Englander. And I've known that you work on Albany, which is in New York. And that didn't quite make sense to me. But as you answer, I think part of it made it make more sense to me. I think what you're asking here, Joe, is how does a New Englander like me end up studying early New York history? And the answer is by accident. 
I actually went to graduate school with the idea that I wanted to study how the Dutch Revolt, which was the Dutch War for Independence from Spain that took place between 1568 and 1648, influenced the ideas of the American Revolution. And I was curious about this topic because I had read scholars who claimed that the English came up with ideas during the English Revolution or Civil War that the Americans used and built upon during the American Revolution, which the French in turn used and built upon during the French Revolution, which in turn all these other revolutions are using and building upon during the Age of Revolutions. And I wanted to know where the ideas of the Dutch Revolt fit into this bigger picture. So I went out to California and I met up with my advisor, who was Alan Taylor, during the first few weeks of grad school and told him about what I thought was a great dissertation project. And Alan turned to me and he said, this is a really interesting project, but it's not a dissertation. I can't let you research and write a dissertation on this topic because it's comparative and comparative dissertations won't get you a job. He said, you'll submit them to job committees and no one will really know whether you study early American history or European history. So we need to find you a dissertation topic that highlights the fact that you're an early American historian. So fast forward a few weeks, I'm back in Alan's office, not with a dissertation topic, and we're just talking. And at some point during the conversation, I said to Alan, I don't really understand why people outside of New York and New England think that New York is part of the region. And Alan said, that's a fascinating topic. You should really look at the history of Albany. So I went and spent my first couple of years in grad school looking at the history of Albany and really looking at the post-revolution New England migration or the New England diaspora into New York State. And that's where I found my answer to that question I asked Alan. The reason that many people outside of New York and New England think that New York is part of New England because during that diaspora, 700 to 800,000 New Englanders migrated into New York State and established new New England towns. So I had that conversation with Alan in late 2004, and now it's 2016, and I'm still working on Albany, New York. To answer Mark's question about what my book project's about, it's a revision of my dissertation. I'm calling it America's First Gateway, Albany in the Making of America. And what that project seeks to understand is how early Americans overcame intense periods of cultural and political conflict. And Albany is the perfect place to investigate these ideas because between 1614 and 1830, it sat at or near the center of four imperial wars. These wars brought all sorts of different people into the city and they were mixing. So you have lots of different cultures mixing and causing conflict. Plus, there's the political aspect of it being imperial wars. So you have political conflict as well. After the revolution, Albany also sits at or near the center of the market and transportation revolutions, which again brings many different people into the city and causes all sorts of problems. Now, the reason that these wars and these revolutions take place in or near Albany is because of its geographic location. Albany occupies a very important geography. The city is located on the west banks of the Hudson River, approximately 150 miles north from New York City and the Atlantic Ocean. It sits as far north as Henry Hudson and his 80 ton to Hall or Half Moon ship could sail up the Hudson without getting stuck. Now, if you were to get out of a big ship at Albany, you could get onto smaller watercraft and continue north up on the Hudson River. And using its system of portages and the river, you would find your way into Lake Champlain and from Lake Champlain into the St. Lawrence River. So you could find your way north into Canada. And if you really wanted to, you could go out the St. Lawrence into the Atlantic Ocean that way. Now, if that weren't great geographic position enough, Albany also sits seven miles below where the Mohawk River empties into the Hudson River. If you were to take smaller watercraft into the Mohawk River, you'd find yourself being able to use the river and a system of portages and lakes and other rivers to get yourself all the way out to the Great Lakes region. And this is really important because we often forget that in early America before the 1820s and 30s, really, the easiest way to travel across a continent is by water. And Albany occupies a very important riverine position. And that's why everybody's always coming to and fighting over Albany. So that's what my book's about and why I study Albany. Jonathan would like to know, aside from early American history, and I guess if you hadn't gotten stuck, what field of history would you want to study? This probably sounds like a cop out, but I'm really fascinated by British history, especially in the 18th century. I now have a new interest in Canadian history, so I might study that. And that Dutch revolt period of Dutch history really fascinates me, too. So if I couldn't study early American history, I'd probably be studying British, Canadian or Dutch history. So if you couldn't study 18th century British Atlantic history, I think Jonathan and many of your listeners, because I know you've gotten this question at various times, want to know even beyond that Civil War, World War II, Cold War. Jeez, guys, I don't know. I mean, I really love that Atlantic history. Maybe the Egyptians. 
I found Egypt really fascinating when Tim and I traveled there in 2008. So yeah, I'll go with the ancient Egyptians. Next, we have a few questions about Ben Franklin's world itself. So Leslie would like to know how you started your podcast. Is it your full-time job and how you produce and sustain Ben Franklin's world week to week? Ben Franklin's world got its start because in 2012, I started listening to podcasts and very quickly became a podcast junkie. It's a technical term, an industry term for someone who consumes lots and lots of podcasts. There was a problem in my podcast consumption, however, and that was I couldn't find a history show I wanted to listen to. In 2012, most of the history podcasts available offered broad overview lectures about some aspect of the past. And what I wanted were in-depth conversations between historians about particular aspects of history or well-researched narratives. And I just couldn't find a show I wanted to listen to. So at the end of 2012, I decided, well, if I can't find my perfect dream podcast, I'll just go out and I'll create one. And that led me to research how to podcast for the next 18 months. I figured if I'm really going to do this, if I'm really going to start a history podcast, I need to know how to produce a high quality show and a show that will be successful. That brings us to October 7, 2014. I launched Ben Franklin's World. And What's pretty amazing is I launched Ben Franklin's World as a side project. I never intended for Ben Franklin's World to be my full-time job or my full-time scholarly contribution, but that's how it's happened today. And the reason that has happened is because so many listeners and historians love the show that they go out and they tell their friends about it. So Ben Franklin's World grew from 288 downloads per month in October 2014 to over 68,000 downloads a month today. That's just incredible. And what it showed me was this was more than a side project. And you can probably see how my thought process has changed if you've listened to the shows from the very beginning up till now, because you can hear how the editing and the time I've taken with the show has increased. Episodes and the flow of the conversation have just gotten smoother as we get to the present day. So Ben Franklin's World did start as a part time, really like a hobby. And today it's a full time job. In terms of how I produce the show, I research every historic site and historic project we have on the show, and I really do read every book on the show from cover to cover. A lot of listeners like to comment about how I ask such good questions, and it's because I actually take the time to research guests and read their books so I know what questions to ask. After I have a conversation with a guest, after we've prepared, had our conversation, I then go through and I edit the show. I use a software called Adobe Audition. And what I do is I try to take out breath sounds, ahs, ums, things that will distract from the show, any tangents that don't make sense. I take those out and I'll sometimes move information around so the flow of the story and the conversation works out really well. After I edit the show, I send it to our professional audio engineer, Daryl Darnell of Pro Podcast Solutions, who edits the show again, fixes what I missed. He then puts the whole show together and makes it sound as good as it possibly can. He then sends those files back to me. Then I add metadata, which is the information about the show, to the file, upload it to our host at Libsyn, and then I edit and schedule the show notes to post. So there's a lot of work involved in the show, but I don't know about you. I think it's totally worth it. I like having a smooth podcast to listen to. Finally, in terms of how I sustain the show, I'm still really trying to figure that out. Podcasts are free to consume, but sadly, they are not free to produce. And one like Ben Franklin's world, where we actually invest in a professional audio engineer, great hosting, an app, and software where I can really edit the show and help promote it, that runs into the range of about $650 per month. And in terms of how I cover that cost, $140 a month or thereabouts come from listener donation. They went to benfranklinsworld.com slash movement, and they contributed to the crowdfunding campaign. So I use all of that money to help produce the show. Another way that we get money to help sustain it is through our partnership with the Omohundro Institute. That Doing History series, not only do they help produce it, but they actually pay for the production costs and pay me to produce it. So I've used all that money to go back into the podcast and help keep Ben Franklin's world going. I'm also starting to get some consulting fees and some paid speaking opportunities. And again, I'm using that money to help keep the show going. And when that doesn't work out, when I run short, my partner, Tim, who I like to call the patron saint of Ben Franklin's world, helps meet those costs. Tim has been the show's number one fan, my number one fan from the very beginning. 
He's very supportive of this project. But in the end, I'd like to make it so Tim wasn't supporting the project. I'd like for Ben Franklin's world, you know, to stand on its own two feet. I am trying to figure out ways that I can help make the project sustainable. And one of those ways in the future may actually be advertising, but I'm still thinking that one through. So that's the behind the scenes look about how the show got its start and how I produce and sustain it. Susan would like to know how long it takes you to prepare for an interview. What is your workflow like to prepare for each podcast episode? Preparation is key to producing high quality content, which is the type of content I want to air here on Ben Franklin's World. And the time I devote to preparing for each interview really varies. It only takes me an hour or two to research a historic site or other historical project, but it takes me much longer to read a book. And as I mentioned, I do read each and every book that's on the show because I want to be able to ask the best questions possible. And I'm not a fast reader, so reading a book can take me anywhere from four hours to 15 hours, maybe a little more if it's a really big book. In addition to reading the book and researching these historic sites, I also take about 30 minutes before each interview to go over my questions to think through, you know, what I want to ask the historian and to practice their introduction because, you know, I don't want to mess up their name. So that goes into the prep too. All told, I would say that Episodes of Ben Franklin's World take about 40 to 60 hours to produce. That's really not a surprise to me because I try to offer high quality content and producing something that's really well done just takes time. You have a few questions from listeners interested in time travel. I guess this doesn't surprise me because we do the time warp every show. And we'll get to that. So Mark and Chris asked very similar questions about if you could go back in time, and I don't think I'll restrict you from the 18th century British Atlantic in this, if you could go back in time, what historical period would you go to and where would you live and why? Well, to be clear, I don't want to live in the past. I just want to visit it. I'm often thankful that when I do visit the past in my mind that I can't smell early America. I'm convinced that urban areas in early America smelled really atrocious and I really don't want that experience. But following along with these questions here, if I were to go back to the past, I'd really like to visit Albany between 1763 and 1777 because even after 12 years of research, I still have a lot of questions about how the revolution took place there. So I'd like to get on the ground, do a bit of fact finding, see if what the sources tell me were accurate or not accurate, get a feel for the city. You know, I often picture Albany based on these historic maps, and I just like to get on the ground and kind of walk the historic streets and see those great big water spouts that I found in my research and just kind of experience the city. So yeah, if I had to visit the past, I'd go to Albany during the revolutionary period. Hallie has a question that's actually one of my favorite as a beginning of semester icebreaker. If you could pick three people who lived from 1600 to 1850 to have dinner with, who would you pick and why? Well, I think we need to start with the obvious here, right? Yes. Benjamin Franklin. Yes. It may surprise most people to know that I am not a Ben Franklin expert. In fact, I chose him solely for marketing purposes because when you say his name, he evokes the time period and places that I want to talk about on this podcast. In fact, I'm not even sure some days if I pick Benjamin Franklin or Franklin picked me because the story of how the show came to be called Ben Franklin's World, I kid you not, it was Christmas Eve 2013. I went to bed and at 3 or 3.30 that morning, I woke and I said, Ben Franklin's World or Ben Franklin's America. And I ran out to write this down and I did my best not to wake him up to buy me the domain names right away. So that's how the show got its name. And, you know, in the end, it's worked out really well for me because Franklin was self-educated. He's really into DIY. He was an entrepreneur. So if I have questions about, you know, what I should do with this podcast, sometimes I really do look to Ben Franklin as an example of, well, if Franklin did this, could it work in this new context? So I'd love to have dinner with Ben Franklin. The second person I'd love to have dinner with is Katerina von Rensselaer Schuyler. She's the wife of Philip Schuyler, and if I'm going to reverse the rule of coverture, I guess that means that Philip Schuyler has to come to dinner too. And I have questions about Philip, and I have questions about Katerina. She had 16 children. She ran a huge household. She survived the war for independence, and that's with soldiers picking apart her house and taking their livestock. And she seems like a remarkable woman, and I'd like to have dinner with her. And I am really curious about Philip. Was he really this patrician person that people found it really hard to relate to? Because that's what 
what Yankees said of him. And yet his letters show that he was like this kind, caring, very, you know, fatherly person to his children. He seemed really approachable. So I'm really not sure what to make of Philip Schuyler. So I figure I can get really good insight by meeting his wife, figuring out, you know, what kind of remarkable woman she was, and then figuring out from there what kind of man he was. And the third person I'd like to invite to dinner is Elkana Watson. And I'm pretty sure he's going to be insufferable at dinner because he's a self-promoter. As Hugh Meredith Flick said in his dissertation, Elkana Watson, gentleman promoter. But he's the Yankee that I really got into researching the post-revolution New England migration into New York. He was prolific. He kept like four different journals and he kept this commonplace book where he cut out every newspaper article or editorial he wrote and letters to different people with comments on the side. So he's been really important to my research. And more than that, he's really one of those people that is always in the right right place at the right time for historians. So he can't get into the revolution as a soldier because he's apprenticed to the Brown Brothers of Providence, but he does run errands for the Patriots and the Brown Brothers during the revolution. So he takes this long ride from Rhode Island down to South Carolina with money lined in his coat. And he makes notes of like what the Southern colonies are like and about slavery. So he has lots of stories to tell about the colonial period. But then, you know, as he ends his apprenticeship, the Brown Brothers invite him to be their factor in France. So he goes over to France where he meets Benjamin Franklin, among others, and he supposedly ends up currying early drafts of what will become the Treaty of Paris 1783 to London. And then he's in Parliament when King George III recognizes the independence of the United States. Plus, there's the whole fact that he claims he's the father of the New York Canal system, which in some cases is true. And, you know, he's also in this vanguard of the New England diaspora. So he seems like a really interesting individual. Like I said, I'm pretty sure he's going to be insufferable at dinner, always talking about himself. But I think I could put up with it for a couple hours because I am really curious about him. That sounds like a fascinating source and a fascinating guy. Mark would like to know what you think the most interesting or significant historical event in Ben Franklin's world was. I'd have to say it's the American Revolution. Franklin lived an awfully long life. He was born in January 1706 and died in April 1790. And he had the opportunity to participate in a lot of different events and movements. But the American Revolution, that brought Franklin to London, where he was able to interact with the scientists he'd been corresponding with, politicians he'd been corresponding with. It allowed him to participate in politics on the ground, which he couldn't necessarily do while in Pennsylvania. And the same could be said of the opportunities he had while in France. So I do think that the American Revolution was the most interesting and formative experience of Franklin's life. But that's just my opinion. I'm sure there's lots of books that may tell you something different. And I agree. I don't know what Mark thinks, but I agree. So as you know, and I know you saw the show, many historians are obsessed with Hamilton. Other than that show, what currently is your favorite depiction of early America in popular culture, whether that be a book or a TV show or a movie or something else? Wow. This is a tough question for me because I don't consume a lot of historical fiction especially historical fiction about early America, because it annoys me when people add drama and play with the timeline. With that said, in September 2014, when I took Tim on our French and Indian War tour vacation, which he just thought was a vacation cruise through the Canadian Maritimes, at our first stop, we stopped in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and we took a bus tour over to Grand Pre and the Bay of Fundy because I wanted to see where the Acadians had lived. And on our way back from Grand Pre, our tour guide spent 20 minutes talking about this book that talked about African-American life in Nova Scotia after the revolution. He said the book's name was Book of Negroes. It was by Lawrence Hill, historical fiction. And when we stopped at Prince Edward Island, I found a bookstore because this is how I vacation. I go to historic sites and I go to bookstores. I found a copy of the Book of Negroes in this bookstore. So I picked up a copy and I read it just last year and it was fantastic. So the book follows this woman named Omniata Diallo. She's an African child. She grows up in Africa. And when she's about 11, the slave catchers catch her and they march her from the interior of Africa to the Gold Coast. And from there, she gets on a slave ship, makes the middle passage and ends up in South Carolina. So she's with two owners in South Carolina. So you talk about what it was like to live and work on a plantation, the dangers of being an, an attractive African-American woman slave. And she also ends up in Charleston, South Carolina, with her second owner, who also takes her to New York City, where she escapes. So Omniata experiences the American Revolution largely in New York City. And while she's in New York, because she's literate, she's exceptional in this story. She's very literate. She speaks lots of languages. She ends up helping the British. 
And after the British evacuate, she takes a boat and goes up to Nova Scotia. So she experiences life as an African-American loyalist, former slave in Nova Scotia. And then she ends up in Sierra Leone, goes back to her village in Africa as well, and then goes to London to help Wilberforce and the other abolitionists and the English Atlantic slave trade. So I found it to be a remarkable book that just covered this long period of the 18th century, the American Revolutionary period, you know, broadly and from the 1750s to the early 19th century. So, yeah, Book of Negroes covers a period pretty well, and I found it a very compelling read. So this episode is your 100th episode. And part of the reason I'm here is to help you celebrate that and talk to you about the history and present and future of the podcast. So looking back over the first 100 episodes, what discovery, what thing that you've learned about early America and early American history has most surprised you? I think what has surprised me most is just how big early America is. Like in the historical profession, early America comprises this very small specialized subfield. And yet over the last 99 episodes, I've read a lot of different books and researched a lot of different historic sites and projects that are all different and give this small subfield a very vast feeling. It's a feeling I didn't acquire in graduate school, I don't think. In graduate school, as you train to be a historian, we go through this process where in your first years, you do a lot of reading for seminars. And then somewhere during your second or third year, you're given a long reading list by your advisors and your committee members of different books about history that you should know about. This is how we beef up on what we call the historiography. We try to learn what the different arguments and views of early American and American history are by reading lots of books about it. But what's been interesting is when you look at your comps lists, it's largely determined by your personal interests and the interests of your committee members. So in my program, I read a lot of books on cultural history and political history and Native American history, but I didn't read a lot of books on slavery or women and gender history or religious history. And because of this podcast, I've been able to access some of those subfields, you know, that I didn't appreciate in grad school, that I didn't really have exposure to in grad school. So yeah, I think within the last 99 episodes, doing Ben Franklin's world has just given me an idea of just how complex and how diverse and how big this relatively small period of history is. One of the reasons you said that you started the podcast was because there wasn't a history podcast out there that you felt accomplished certain things. How different is the landscape for podcasts today, some two years later? It's different. The landscape of history podcasts and their availability has changed a lot. There are a lot more historians who are podcasting now. There are some who podcast just about their specific subfield. Others who, like us, interview different historians every week or every other week. There are some that offer local history. I'm thinking about the Brooklyn Historical Society podcast. And some where historians just make it their job to talk about how events of the past have inspired events of our present day. I'm thinking about past, present. So there are a lot more historians podcasting now. And what I find a little bit overwhelming to think about is the role that Ben Franklin's world and you have played in that changed landscape. A lot of these historians started podcasting because they saw the reaction that we were getting on Ben Franklin's world. They saw that you were interested in high quality scholarly history and they've all started their own shows. They're very different, you know, trying to bring, again, high quality scholarly history, well-researched history so others can enjoy it, so non-historians can enjoy it. So, yeah, I mean, the space is very different now and I think it's a good thing. And I am actually really excited to see how it continues to progress in the future. Now it's time to move to the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. For this time warp, I want to ask you a question that comes at the intersection of your interests in upstate New York and Benjamin Franklin. In your opinion, what might have happened if the colonies that met in Albany in 1754 had agreed to Franklin's proposed plan to create a unified system of government for them? I think four of my six dissertation chapters and my book would be very different. Of course, I also think that they would both explore how early Americans overcame cultural and regional conflict to form one distinctive wing of the British Empire. 
Because when I look at the history of the American Revolution, I see that it takes the colonies a very long time to unite as states. In fact, I think we could argue that they were only somewhat united until really the World War II period. And my early forays into my second project, which is on the Articles of Confederation, reveal that the union of the states into one nation was really kind of like a marriage of convenience. Again, you know, this project's still really early on. I have a lot of research to do. But my preliminary reading on it is the United States states become a nation because France, the Netherlands, and Spain wouldn't assist them as individual entities. They only wanted to deal with one nation. So I think we'd be looking at a history where if the British colonies had stayed colonies and had adopted Franklin's plan of union, you'd still see this period of negotiation, probably a long period of negotiation, where they're trying to figure out how to deal with their regional and cultural differences between the different colonies and their very diverse populations. I also think that our memory of Benjamin Franklin as a founder would be grander in this new scenario than it is today. And he already holds such a big place. So I can only imagine how big his place and role as a founder would be if the colonies had adopted his plan of union. And I don't think he'd mind that. No, I don't think he would. Before we conclude, would you tell us what aspect of history you're researching and writing about now? Well, I spend most of my time podcasting about history now, so I don't usually have a lot of time to research and write about it. But when I do occasionally research and write about history now, I have my Albany book project, which you heard about, and I have my second project on the Articles of Confederation. And I became interested in the Articles of Confederation and how they're drafted because through this podcast, I'd been reading a lot of modern day history books talking about the Articles as a mere stepping stone to the Constitution, which really surprised me because we shouldn't forget that the people of the past have no idea how the future is going to turn out. So I'm assuming that when the founders drafted the Articles of Confederation, they did so with the idea that it would be the lasting government for the nation. But again, this project is so early on, I don't really know that for sure. But I do want to research it more. So I do have the Articles of Confederation project in the works as well. So that's what I'm researching and writing about now, when and if I have time to research and write. Many of your listeners know this, but where is the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? The best place is my email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. I check my email. I read my email. I respond to my email. So it's always the best place to get a hold of me. Twitter is the second best place. I love Twitter. I live on Twitter. So always feel free to tweet me at Liz Covart. Or you can join the Ben Franklin's World community on Facebook. I hang out in that community. We all post different articles and events of interest about early American history in that community. And we have conversations about it. So it's a fun place to hang out. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to guest host this episode. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for hosting this episode and for celebrating episode 100 with us. We can't wait to have you back as a guest so we can learn more about your work. Thank you and congratulations. Well, there you have it. The answers to your questions. I hope you enjoyed this celebratory episode, which took you a bit inside my life and behind the scenes of Ben Franklin's world. If you still have questions for me, please feel free to send me an email or post them in the Ben Franklin's World community on Facebook. Thank you again, Joseph Edelman, for hosting this special episode. You did such a great job asking all of our questions, and we're really looking forward to having you back on the show as a guest so we can talk about your forthcoming book, tentatively titled Revolutionary Networks, The Business of Printing and the Production of American Politics, 1763 to 1789. As always, I've posted show notes for this episode. On the show notes page, you'll find a list of the different topics we talked about today, contact information for me and Joe, plus links to the books, podcasts, and podcast resources I mentioned during our conversation. benfranklinsworld.com slash 100. Next week, we'll be back to our usual format with me asking the questions of our new guest historian. Finally, if I gave you a time machine, where would you go and who would you have dinner with? Send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today. <laughs>